Hi, I'm Dr. Althea Kaminsky for The Learning Scientist, and in this video, I want to talk to you about prospective memory. So first, I want to apologize for the lateness of this video. This was supposed to be posted in February, and I am recording it in the first week of March. Long story short, there was a calendar mishap. Um, I don't know about you, but my life operates on a sort of complicated system involving my planner, a Google calendar, an Outlook calendar, a series of very helpful email reminders, and um, sometimes things fall through the cracks. One of the kind of deep ironies about studying memory is that despite all of my best efforts, I still sometimes forget to do things. But your memory for how to do things is a little different from our memory of things. Usually I talk a lot about our memory for things and how to improve our memory and how to improve our learning. But today we're gonna to talk about how to improve our memory for doing things in the future. So prospective memory refers to our memory for future events. Remember, uh, sorry, remember to answer that email later today. Remember to take your medicine after dinner. Remember to call your mother. Those types of things are all prospective memory tasks. Usually, again, when we talk about memory, we're talking about memory for a past event. So remember that article you read last week um, or remember what you got for your birthday. Uh, remember what the doctor said. Those types of things are all kind of retrospective memory and typically what we think of when we talk about memory. So if you're watching this, you're probably familiar with the idea that memory is cue driven. Uh, by that, we mean that memories are stored across our neural networks and are activated or remembered when a cue triggers them. For example, last night, my husband found some of the old schoolhouse rock videos. And as soon as one of those songs turned on, I was shocked at how many of the words I remembered. He was a little shocked. Um, it was the song about adjectives. Um, and as soon as I heard the first few bars of that song, I suddenly remembered all the words and was singing along and anticipating the next line. So that melody, the first few bars um, of that song are the cue that helped activate this memory, right? So that I could follow along and predict what the next thing is going to be. Prospective memory also works with cues, but it's a little different because with prospective memory, when you're trying to remember to do something in the future, you're in a way kind of assigning the cue to the future. You're trying to predict what your life is going to be like when you need to be remembering this task. And so you say, okay, I'm going to remember to check my email when I get into the office, right? You are not in your office remembering to check your email. You're trying to set it in the future. And so we say there's a failure prospective memory when the time or the event comes and you don't remember the thing you're supposed to remember, right? When you are, when you get to your office and you don't check your email, right? That would be a failure prospective memory in that example. So I should note that prospective memory works better in general, and I'm going to explain a little bit more specifically, but in general, it works better when you actually assign a cue. So in that example, I didn't just say, oh, I'm going to check my email. I said, I'm going to check my email when I get into the office, right? So I assigned a cue. I said, the office, me arriving in this location will be my cue to remember this specific task, right? So we already know, I'm sure that there's failures to do this when you just say, oh yeah, I'll get to that thing or mm, I'll do that thing later. There's a lack of specificity there that's really helpful for actually helping you remember to do it because you're assigning a cue for this task. There are two types of cues that people often assign for prospective memory tasks. Um, some are time-based and some are event-based. So um, Time-based things happen around a certain time of the day. At 325, this thing happens. A really common example of something that people will assign a time-based cue for might be your medication. A lot of medications uh, take place on a very specific schedule, right? Take twice a day, take four times a day, no more or no closer than four hours apart, right? There can be really some really specific schedules and routines that you need to follow with your medication. So what a lot of people naturally say, will naturally do is they'll sit down and say, okay, here's what I need to take. I need to take this twice a day. So we're going to say 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Or, or, you know, whatever. So they'll, they'll make a schedule based on their calendar for the day. So again, that's time-based saying I'm going to do this thing at this specific time. 
The other kind of version of this cue that you could have is event-based. So instead of assigning a time to do something, you specify which event will serve as the cue. So instead of saying, I'm going to take my medication at 7 p.m., you might say, I'm going to take my medication after dinner, which may end up being at about 7 p.m., but you've assigned it to this event. So you kind of make it part of this routine instead of watching the clock and saying, oh, now it's 7, or setting alarm, which is what a lot of people do when they need to remember to take their medication, you set an alarm. So research and prospective memory has shown that we are more likely to remember something when it's associated with an event than if it's associated with a time. The reason for this is actually pretty straightforward, I think. We're bad at monitoring time. It's not something that we are consciously doing throughout the day. Um, there's also a lot of weird things that happen with our like perception of time. I'm sure that you've uh, been doing some task and been really engrossed and absorbed in what you're doing, and time has just flown by. Maybe you're reading a good book. Maybe um, you're just you know, spending time with your family and just, wow, the time flew by. You didn't even realize that you've been doing this activity for a few hours. So that can happen. On the other hand, we know that there's also these unfortunate times when just minutes can seem grueling, right? When you're sitting around waiting for something to happen and you keep checking the clock and you're like, all right, it's been forever. And then you look at the clock and say, oh, wow, only a few minutes has passed. So our perception of time isn't super straightforward. It's not something that we are all consciously monitoring and have a good kind of internal mechanism for remembering something. So when we set time as the cue, we kind of fail at it a lot. That's why a lot of people have to set alarms to remind themselves. On the other hand, events are more kind of distinct and specific, and we consciously know what we're doing, right? So what time dinner happens may tend to fall around the same time every day just because we get into our routines, but we're generally more conscious of the fact of, oh, hey, dinner's coming up, I should probably do something, versus, oh, it's you know 5.55 exactly on the nose, and this means I need to do something. This is not to say that we don't form habits and routines around time. Obviously, that happens. We have circadian rhythms. Right? Our um, body recognizes certain times of day, and we get into routines and habits based on that. If you wake up at 5 a.m. every morning, uh, eventually you have to stop, or eventually you can stop setting your alarm because your body will just recognize that it's 5 a.m. and it's time to get up, right? That will keep happening. Of course, our perception of time in that sense is still very complicated and is still regulated th by things like sunlight um, and like uh, light from computer screens. This is part of the reason why things kind of fall apart a little bit around daylight savings when the time it says on the clock feels so different from our own kind of internal measure of what time has passed. And it takes us a few days to get used to, you know, I, I thought it would be light outside at 6 a.m. and now it's no longer light outside, I have trouble figuring out what time it is. So again, we can establish routines and remember to do things around times of the day, <clears throat> but that mechanism is different than us just kind of having an internal clock that's always accurate, right? Understanding exactly that it's 6.55 p.m. or something like that. So in general, again, events are going to be the better cue for prospective memory tasks. So if you are trying to remember when to take your medication, it's a better idea to say, I'm going to take it after dinner or before dinner, you know, whatever, or breakfast, lunch, right? Whenever it fits into your routine and schedule based on the medication schedule as well. This, this kind of idea about prospective memory or memory to do certain tasks clearly has a lot of implications for how we run and manage our lives. Uh, a lot of the effective learning strategies that we talk about require a fair deal of planning and kind of time management, right? You need, if you're going to sit down and practice retrieval, practice uh, space to retrieval, you need to schedule that, right? You need to time that out and make it a part of your study habits of your studying routine. One method is to literally take your calendar and schedule it out. And for some of us, that's just what it's going to have to be. But another way to think about it, another way to kind of ingrain it in your personal schedules and routines is to assign a prospective memory cue to say, okay, um, after I uh, put the kids to bed tonight, I'm going to do the following things. I'm going to sit down and spend some time studying. Or maybe it's after I... I 
I use meals as my event-based cues a lot because most of my life revolves around when I eat. So after lunch or before lunch, I, I'm going to make sure that I review this thing. And again, when we make these things a part of our daily routines and habits, it's a lot easier for us to remember to do them. I'm sure you've had an off week where something about your schedule has changed. And suddenly all these things that you just did day in and day out, you start missing missing then you start dropping the ball because your normal chain of events your normal cues that you have lined up to remember to do these things gets kind of wonky and gets a bit messed up this is um if, in case you needed another reason to hate daylight savings time this is one of them right things get out of whack things get a little wonky so ideally we would be able to live our lives like that to say okay well you know I'm going to remember to do this thing after this event happens. I'm going to remember to answer that email or write up that draft or make that lesson plan as soon as this other thing's done. That would be nice, but not everything can be event-based. Uh, we have meetings at 9.30 exactly, phone calls that you need to be on by 9.15, practice that ends at four, right? A lot of our life, revolves around these very strictly timed events. So remembering to do or to show up to these things has to be time-based a lot of the times. This is where our calendars and day planners come in to help us to be this sort of external memory cue. Of course, you have to remember to check your calendar and to check your planner at regular intervals and to update them and it becomes a whole system and a whole thing you have to manage outside of the life that you're already managing, right? There's a rabbit hole that we go down with that. But again, it is easier, and I'm, I can certainly notice in my life, that it's easier for me to remember to do all those series of events and things when they follow a regular routine or schedule. So it can be really easy to forget to remember to do things. When you have an event or a task that falls outside of your daily routine or weekly routine, things that happen once a month, once every three months, once a year, right? These things are kind of more difficult to remember to do and to plan around. There are different systems that we have in place for that. All of this is to say is that perspective memory can be challenging. Um, and sometimes even memory researchers forget to do things. The difference is, is that I know exactly why I forgot to do something. Um, and it, you know, it sucks, but it's just part of being a human and part of how our memory works. 